Welcome everybody to another edition of the Rotter Art Colloquium. So our invited speaker today is uh, Cherry Ng. And Cherry is, uh, uh, she is a research associate at the Dunlop Institute for Astronomy and Astrophysics in Toronto. And her whole career has been about uh, hunting for things that go boom. So she started her PhD with the, uh, the things that go boom that everyone knows about pulsars, right? So she, uh, she discovered about 100 new pulsars with parks. And then subsequently she went to work on the Chime telescope where she was chasing fast radio bursts. So the more exotic variety of things that go bump. And now she is chasing after the most exotic variety of things that go bump of them all. And that's, uh, you know, things that go bump, aka techno signatures, aka aliens. And so she is going to talk to us about that today. Uh, Please, folks, if you have questions, put them into chat so Cherry can answer them at the end of the talk. Uh, but otherwise, Cherry, the floor is yours. Thanks, Alec, for the introduction. I'll start sharing my screen. Um, hopefully, you can see my slide now. Yeah, OK, yes, great. So let's, cool, let's get started. Um, so as Oleg said, today I'll be talking about um, the breakthroughs in interferometric SETI with a particular uh, example on the Meerkat telescope. First of all, I would like to... Yes, recording. First of all, I would like to introduce the breakthroughs in Meerkat team. We have a number of researchers on the team. Apart from me, we have postdoc Daniel Czech, who is from South Africa. Dave McMahon is the chief software engineer. Matt Lefowski is the system administrator. Recently, we hired Mark Rusindana, who is working on the GPU programming side of things. And a wider team from the Brick to Listen group is involved in various capacities as well. We have also a large group of students who have been the main driving force of the project. Our students include Nick Tuesday from Penn State, Peter Ma from Toronto, Max Hawkins from Alabama, Bart, Bart Wodacek Croker from Manchester, UK, and Japan Zhang from Carleton. Now we are actively recruiting new students. So if you are interested in any aspect of this project after hearing my talk today, please do get in touch. I'll be very happy to have a chat with you regarding um, yeah, research opportunities. In addition, we collaborate closely with scientists from the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory, SARAO. And so here are so showing some of our main collaborators, Sarah Buchner, Dave Horn, Melissa Gia, and Ruby Van Ruyen. I think Ruby is actually on the call, so a shout out to Ruby. And, and I guess some of you know these people from Sereo. Okay, now back to the science. Now, why are we talking about SETI now, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence? In the last few years, the Kepler mission has discovered thousands of exoplanets. It is estimated that roughly one in five stars has an exoplanet orbiting the habitable zone where water exists in liquid form. So that means overall there are likely billions of Earth-like worlds in our galaxy alone. With the advancement of technology on our own Earth, there has never been a better time to conduct a large scale search to find life in the universe. SETI in particular looks for techno signature, which are signals emitted by other advanced civilizations. This is analogous to a complementary research field of the search of biosignature, which um, let's, um, look for molecular lines like water. So what exactly is the SETI signal that we are looking for? The honest answer is that we don't know, but we can make some educated guesses of what a potential SETI might look like and where to start our search. One obvious first step is to take inspiration from human-made technology um, seen from space. Oh, well, well, in space, the seen from Earth. Now on the left here, you can see an example of the signal from the Voyager spacecraft that has been detected by the Green Bank Telescope. 
Human technology is very good at using filters to concentrate information in a small region of the spectrum. You probably have experienced that firsthand if you're in a, in a, in a car say, trying to tune into certain radio station, just by changing the frequency um, for a tiny bit, you already be picking up a different um, channel. That shows how narrow the information can be confined, right? Whereas um, astrophysical emission, they tend to occupy a lot wider in bandwidth. So another characteristic of technical signature is the drift rate that you can see also from the same plot, the fact that um, the signal is drifted in time and frequency. This Doppler drift arises due to the relative acceleration between the um, receiver on Earth and the uh, potential um, transmitter that could be on a, on a star and on an exoplanet. Um, yeah, so there will be a relative acceleration between these two um, um, objects, as you can see from this um, um, animation here. Now, in contrast, a stationary signal generated by human technology on Earth would not have this differential drift, and it would show up more like a vertical line in the time frequency space. So how do we go about looking for a SETI signal? I've mentioned Meerkat at the beginning, which is a radio telescope. So you might wonder why radio? There are two main reasons for that. One is that radio is relatively cheap to produce um, human civilization. We have been using radio for telecommunication for decades now. So we might expect any extraterrestrial civilization to do the same. And the other thing is that as shown as in this figure, our atmosphere is transparent to radio waves, like all these um, parts. So which means we can um, detect any incoming radio waves easier from Earth if we use the radio spectrum. SETI involves a huge parameter space. And here I've listed five main dimensions that I can think about. And we already talked about the drift rate, which uh, is due to the unknown orbital and rotational parameter of the potential star planet. And we've talked about the frequency range, the, the fact that uh, we tend to search in radio band. And now it has also been suggested that the frequency range between 1400 or so to 1600 uh, megahertz is particularly interesting, the so-called water hole because this is a relatively uh, quiet band in the interstellar radial noise background. What about sky coverage? Now, it has been estimated that there are roughly 100 to 400 billion stars in our Milky Way alone, which is a lot of stars to search. And we also have to think about the time domain because the SETI signal could be intermittent now you looked at this particular star today and you didn't detect any SETI signal. It doesn't mean there is no ETI. It could be just that they didn't um, transmit on the particular day. And finally, we need to consider telescope sensitivity. How far can we detect a transmitter signal from? Um, for example, uh, on Earth, the Arecibo planetary radar has previously been the most powerful radar um, that can transmit a power of 10 to the uh, 13 watts. So if we assume extraterrestrial um, civilization to have comparable technology, and we use that as a reference, so how far out can we detect an Arecibo-like radar from Earth? With this huge um, parameter space, SETI is really a big endeavor. And this is why um, Breakthrough Listen comes in to play. Breakthrough Listen is a 10-year $100 million program in search for evidence of techno um, technological civilizations in the universe. Our main goal is to survey 100 nearby galaxies, the entire galactic plane, as well as monitor 1 million nearby stars at a wide range of radio and optical frequency band. Now, big single dish radio telescope like the Green Bank radio telescope in the US and the Parkes radio telescope in Australia, they, these two, they have been the main facilities of breakthrough listen so far. And by now we have observed of the order of a thousand targets with these two telescopes and amounting to two petabytes of data. 
all of which are made publicly available. You can find them on this link if you want to try your luck and see if you find any uh, city signal in it. Uh, however, this uh, survey speed is still suboptimal. 1,000 stars is a lot, but it's not a lot compared to the total number of stars. And this is why there is a renewed set to interest focusing on interferometric radial telescopes. Now, why interferometer? This equation here shows the relationship between the full width half maximum of the primary beam response of a telescope, or in other words, the field of view of a telescope, which is proportional to the wavelength of the observations um, and inversely proportional to the diameter of the, um, uh, the antenna. So in this table here, we compare the field of view of single dish telescope and interferometers and to be fair, let's fix the uh, wavelength, the observing frequency. Let's assume that all of these telescopes will be observing at one gigahertz. Now you can see that single dish telescope like Green Bank and Parks, they tend to have larger dish diameter, which also means a small field of view. On the other hand, radio interferometer telescopes, they work by combining multiple small antennas together to achieve the highest sensitivity instead of one giant antenna. So you can see here, VLA and Meerkat, they have both smaller diameters. This means they also have larger field of views and, and, and also a faster sky mapping speed. This large field of view of interferometric telescopes makes the concept of commensal beam, form, beam forming interesting. In this cartoon, I'm showing a Meerkat primary observer who might be um, observing, say, a pulsar. Now, if, if we were using Green Bank and Parks, we would just be observing that um, one pulsar and, and that's it. But uh, Meerkat, thanks to the large instantaneous field of view, it actually has sensitivity towards an area um, around the pulsar, a much larger area that the telescope is sensitive to. So in effect, what we can do is to form additional coherent beams represented by the blue cones here, and they can be pointing to other stars in the background at the same time. And effectively, it's like having multiple telescopes observing at the same time, and um, your observing speed is um, multiplied by the same amount. This is the main reason why we are so excited about a SETI project on Meerkat I'm sure many of you, maybe all of you know about Meerkat, but just in case there are some new students here, I've listed a few key facts of the telescope. Meerkat is located in the Radio Quiet um, Reserve in the Curry Desert in Northern Cape. And it has 64 antennas with 13.5 meter diameter. And another 20 antennas are expected to be installed by next year. Meerkat is one of the most sensitive radio telescopes to date and will be integrated with the square kilometer array within the next decade. Now, apart from Meerkat, Brickle Listen have a few other interferometric city searches going on. Um, we have a sister survey uh, that is uh, really comparable to Meerkat in many ways uh, that we are commissioning on the very large array, the VLA in the US. And uh, we also work with the Ellen Telescope Array that is operated by the City Institute in the US, um, which has been a great test bed for interferometric technologies for the Meerkat and the VLA projects. Okay, another novel aspect of the Meerkat SETI project is the ability to conduct commensal observations using multicast Ethernet technology. Well, so a, apart from the primary observers, um, a number of commensal users can subscribe to this uh, same data stream thanks to the multicast internet broadcasting. Now, one of those commensal users is the BLUs, which stands for the Brick to Listen Users Applied Equipments. Uh, thanks to this, we can subscribe to this data stream simultaneously as other telescope users. So then we can piggyback on all Meerkat observations and conduct SETI searches at the same time while other um, astronomers are fulfilling their different science goals. It's very important to make sure that the BLUs won't introduce 
uh, stress or problem to the Meerkat system, and the BOUs can operate commensurately with all the other projects. Daniel and Dave, they have been the key drivers um, for this data acquisition system. And last year, they have demonstrated the success of the so-called N-Shot Molt, where BLUs can automatically record a specific number of observations concurrently with other um, Meerkat users. This is a figure from our student, Nick. Uh, showing in gray is the uptime of the Meerkat telescope from October last year to early March uh, this year. And the green bar is the uptime of VLUs. So it's encourage encouraging to see that we have VLUs have been uh, commensally included in a large fractions of the uh, observations since last Christmas. Meerkat and the VLA, they are going to be game changers in the SETI search sky mapping speed. To better illustrate this point, I've made um, sky projection here uh, showing breakthrough listen observations obtained so far with the Green Bank Telescope, which are the green dots and the red dots is for the park's observations. And this plot on the right uh, shows the number of stars observed uh, as a number uh, of weeks time, basically. And so I already mentioned that so far, um, Green Bank and Parks, we have observed about 1,000 stars. And this is really a big step up compared to any previous study searches. But this is still just a small fraction of the total number of stars. Now, with the VLA and Meerkat, things will look very different. Um, these are simulations, of course, we are still commissioning the system, but uh, we think that with Meerkat, based on the previous um, uh, telescope usage, uh, we will be able to achieve the 1 million star goal with uh, some 80 weeks, so just under two years. With the VLA, um, this progress will be even faster um, because of a particular sky scanning mode of the um, VLA, um, the VLA Sky Survey, it's going to scan large areas of the sky, um, enabling us to cover um, huge uh, areas, um, reaching almost 100 million stars in roughly the same time frame. Now, on, um, oh, I have to point out that um, the sky scanning mode also means the VLA will spend effectively less time on each position. So um, overall, it has, will have less sensitivity than Meerkat, but yeah, it will get us more stars. This is a plot made by an, uh, one of my students, uh, Leo Risk. Uh, he compared the figure of merit of previously conducted SETI searches. So he looked into the sky coverage and the observing frequencies of each SETI project. And he color coded them in three levels of sensitivity, red color meaning high sensitivity projects, those that can detect receiver like signals out to 75 parsec, and the yellow ones are medium sensitivity detecting receiver out to 25 parsec, and the blue are lower sensitivity detecting receiver out to 5 parsec. Um, now, some of the earliest SETI searches began in the 70s, 80s. Although they were a state of the art at the time, on today's scale, they tend to have lower sensitivity and you can see that they occupy a really narrow um, window on the observing frequency uh, scale. And then Breakthrough Listen came along using Green Bang and Parkes Telescope. Um, so we have uh, improved uh, a lot on the sky coverage uh, and the observing frequency as well, and as well as the sensitivity. But uh, this is where Meerkat and VLA will stand. Um, they are both going to be really high up on the sky coverage um, axis. And uh, VLA is going to be really great because it covers a huge um, um, observing band having multiple receivers. Uh, whereas Meerkat will give us really high sensitivity allowing us to search uh, SETI signal out to very large distances. Now, because we are observing um, commensally on Meerkat, we won't get to choose where to point the telescope to. So we'll need a mechanism to find out uh, in a given telescope pointing. 
whatever the primary observer has chosen, what are the nearby stars? We can form those coherent beams um, we talked about. On, uh, we have derived a 26 million star catalog for the target selection purpose. This database has been drawn from the Geyer DR2 catalog. And you can see on this plot here, the distribution um, of the stellar type of this um, sample that we uh, down selected to. Most of them are solar type stars, but there are also a small fraction of cooler and hotter stars. Now almost 20, almost 20,000 of those are within the so-called Earth transit zone, which is the region bracketing the ecliptic from which extraterrestrial observers can detect the transit of our Earth in front of our sun. So the idea is that if there were any ETI on these um, uh, stars or systems, they might have the, they might have detected uh, the presence of our Earth and they might want it to broadcast to us our direction. And so these uh, stars are particularly interesting in that way. Now, in terms of the distance, most of the stars in our database are within uh, two kiloparsec. And you can see here on the x-axis. And the nearest one million star is marked by the dashed line and they're all within 175 parsec. The key idea of our target selection scheme is to cover as many stars as possible rather than repeating on the same subset of sources. Another of our students, Bart, he is working on optimizing the source, um, source scheduling algorithm. On the left, you can see here is a randomly selected field of view of Meerkat. And in fact, there are lots of stars um, within the region that Meerkat can see in, in the same time. So Bart looked into strategically placing those coherently formed beams that we talked about in locations where there are multiple stars. So, um, so represented by this uh, blue eclipse here, uh, I mean, ellipse, blue ellipses. So his, let's say if we form a beam here, we can actually be observing multiple, I think here it's three, probably, three stars at the same time using the same one beam. Bart also takes into account the priority of the sources like um, stars that has, have not previously been observed, those are higher priority on those that have been observed um, before, but somehow incomplete. Uh, so we would want to re repeat those. And he also takes into account the attenuation in sensitivity due to the offset from the beam center. So stars that are closer to the beam uh, field of view uh, center, uh, we would have a higher sensitivity to us and those um, towards the edge, uh, will be less sensitive to. So we would prioritize um, the stars that are closer to the center. Now with this scheme, um, we should be able to reach the 1 million star goal in an even shorter time frame. Another thing we have to worry about is how to differentiate city signals from human generated radio interference. Now, previously with the single dish radio telescope, Green Bang and Parks, um, Breakfallison has bought time on these telescopes and we have full control for the telescope and like we can point to where we want. So the strategy has been to obtain these so-called cadence observations. Um, so illustrated by this cartoon here, let's say we point to a star at position A and let's say there is a steady signal in, this, in, in star A. So we'll, we'll see a drifted signal. And then we'll point the telescope to uh, an offset position, star B, and there, which has no steady signal. And we'll point the telescope back to A, we'll detect it again and point to B, A and B. We re repeat the six times and uh, this is one cadence. So the idea is that SETI signals should appear in all the on-source scans, all the A's and not the B's. Um, so my student, Peter Ma, and he has been working on employing machine learning algorithm to help identify and cluster this specific cadence pattern to help spot SETI signal. Here you can see a scheme of the model that we have developed, um, employing the so-called beta variational autoencoder um, as well as the random forest classifier to, um, um, to classify between SETI and RFI. But with Meerkat and VLA, because we are piggybacking on, all the, uh, on, on observations, we don't have uh, the ability to 
point A, B, A, B, we can't, we won't have the cadence information anymore. So how do we um, deal with that? Now we can do similar spatial filtering technique using the coherent beams that will be forming. And the idea is that safety signal should show up in just one star, so in one beam, coherent beam, whereas uh, RFI um, being um, terrestrial in nature, they would be near field object and they would show up in all or most of the beams represented by these mobile phone uh, icons. And here are some examples of Meerkat data, um, uh, plots of Meerkat data produced by my student, Japun. Japun worked on developing a... Uh, oh. I'll move this away. Yes, so Japan worked on developing an uh, interference flagging algorithm. So he first fit the band path shape and then he um, flagged the interference that show up uh, in the data above a certain threshold. And, and the contaminated RFI region, he's um, highlighting them in green. So the idea is that if there are green flags showing up across multiple pointings, for example, like these areas here, uh, then we can be confident that they are terrestrial interference because you know they are they're always there and they are not um, uh, and and we are unlikely and will be it will be unlikely to detect genuine city signals uh, in those uh, frequency ranges. Putting all these pieces together, um, this is a schematic of our search data flow from the antenna, uh, digitized data sent to the FPGA analyzer. Um, where um, it splits into frequency bins of few megahertz. And this input data is um, of the order of terabits per second, which is a really high data rate, a fraction of the entire cell phone network in North America at any given time. So a lot to process. And now this uh, data uh, is, will be sent to a dedicated SETI GPU cluster. Uh, in the GPU cluster, we'll further channelize the data to about a hertz um, frequency resolution because we, as we said, we need to detect these very narrow drifted signal. And we also will be forming beams um, to point to different stars in the same field of view. Uh, we're also interested to explore imaging technique and particularly in collaboration with OLEG's team at Rhodes. Now we will have to do some interference mitigation, and then this data will be used for the actual the Doppler study search. And we are also exploring new machine learning algorithms to help find the needle in the haystack. Well, I've mostly told you about the software development of our Miracle study project, but we have also made progress on the hardware side. Um, July 2019, we have installed um, a a small amount of notes uh, at the Meerkat site um, with the help of South, Africa, uh, South African students. Um, October last year, we have installed 50% um, of the GPU nodes. Um, you can see here uh, 64 GPU nodes um, in, in installed. And currently we have those 64 GPUs, um, one head node and four storage nodes are on site connected to the network. This is an overall timeline of the Brickley Listen Meerkat project. On the software side, uh, we talked about um, the commensal observing capability that was achieved last Christmas. And this summer we have been able to form incoherent beams. And now we're really close to getting the coherent beam former working. Um, so yeah, I'm expecting a data coming through that very soon. Hardware, um, we are currently at 50% built out. Initially, we had wanted to um, install the remaining hardware um, this summer, but uh, we've been delayed by an industry-wide problem in the GPU availability. Uh, however, this issue is being resolved. And in fact, in a week or two, we uh, will have, um, Dave Horn is going to help us um, install four more new nodes um, on site. And we expect the remaining hardware to arrive by uh, later this year. And that, at that point, we'll be able to begin full operation of Breakthrough Listen Meerkat SETI search. Looking ahead, the multinational square kilometer array and the next generation VLA telescope, they are expected to come online within the next decade. And they will both be 
the most sensitive radio interferometric telescopes ever built. We are obviously very keen to perform SETI projects on these future facilities in order to set the most stringent limits on the presence of SETI signals. Uh, that brings, it, brings me to my summary. Uh, we've talked about some of the latest updates uh, regarding the Brixelis and Meerkat SETI search project. Um, commence observation. Last summer, uh, I mean, last Christmas, sorry, we have successfully demonstrated commence observing capability. In hardware, we're currently at a 50% mark, but this is going to improve um, in the coming weeks and months. The online processing pipeline is in progress and with a huge contribution from our students. Uh, once again, there are lots of opportunities here for uh, new students to join, uh, in particular in the area of imaging, machine learning. So we'll do get in touch if you are interested. Um, now, once fully operational, the Meerkat project will enable Brixelison's 1 million star goal within the next two years, and it will provide key knowledge for conducting steady searches with the SKA and the NGVLA. That's it for me today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cherry. That's fascinating stuff. I should add that uh, Cherry is probably going to have a visiting appointment at one or more South African universities. Uh, so she will be available to supervise students. So students that are interested in these kinds of subjects, you know, please, please reach out to her and, uh, you know, reach out and talk about projects. Uh, do you have questions? I had one obvious question for myself, which was uh, uh, when you say uh, looking in, 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 in images, what sort of signatures should we look for in, let's say, in our regular interferometric images? Do you have an idea? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm looking to you for inspiration. I'm myself not an imaging as, uh, expert. Um, so, and I haven't worked in imaging data with imaging data at all, but I just, I mean, I imagine um, we could detect, uh, I mean, a city signal would, would show up then as a transient um, signal in the image, in, in an imaging um, plane. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm not a, I'm not really aware of any set of city searches being done in imaging data. So this will be a new area to explore. Right. So anything, anything transient with a fine and narrow band spectrum, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Of course, the first pulsars were uh, called little green men, right? For a bit. So, I guess if you're looking for pulsars, you're also automatically looking for SETI, right? Yeah. In some sense. Uh, I see there's a question from Adam in chat. Uh, do you see it, Cherry? Um, no, I, uh, so it's I, will I think I'll have to stop sharing to see the chat. No, I can read it for you. No, go ahead, go ahead. Um, a really, really good talk and presentation. Um, I just want to know, your earlier slide showed you a missing data. And I wanted mm. to know why that is. I see you use GPUs. So I just want to know, was it missing data from Mecca? Or was this it from GPUs? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think it was just our, our oversight. So we were collecting these uh, observing data. And I suppose in the, in the few weeks, um, the, the sensor was turned off on our end. Nothing to do with Meerkat. So we didn't collect that data. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Now, I just want to know that, that similar things. Um, and then also, uh, I noticed the whole processor system is based on GPU and not FPGA, it seems. Um, so I just want to know, what was the main decision in that? And what is your power consumption like as well, if you know that? Um, yeah, I missed a bit of the question. Is you asking GPU versus... What? Yeah, 
versus FPGA. Ah, versus FPGA. Well, I think, I mean, the channelizer, FPGA channelizer, that part is provided by Meerkat. So yeah. that is already there. And now, um, like you said, um, our just our SETI cluster is GPU based, and and the question is why GPU and not FPGA or something else. I think the answer is, uh, I mean, GPU is a little more flexible than FPGAs. Uh, as I've shown in this uh, schematic, there are different modules of uh, searches that we might want to explore. Um, while well, channelizing, we're definitely doing that and forming beams that we could also change the number of beams and we want to explore imaging and all these machine learning um, techniques. I think um, having a GPU-based cluster is just more flexible to mix and match these different pieces as we go along, um, yeah, rather than uh, having an FPGA-based ba uh, yeah, system. Okay. No, thank you. Thanks for that. On, on that note, uh, Jerry, uh, it struck me. Do you know what's 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 the most expensive part on this diagram? Where is the most GPU power going here? Um, we have a good um, handle on the um, number of flops uh, required for the channelizer, which is just a very long FFT, and the beam forming, which is uh, basically multiply at. Um, but uh, I'm not, yeah, I'm currently not sure. And, and okay, and just for these two parts, um, based on the, uh, well, just on, on, and on paper, um, they should be taking only about 10% of our GPU based on the specification of the GPU we bought and how much flops is required. Um, uh, so I suspect the larger part would be in the actual steady search. Now, currently, um, the most um, standard steady search technique, I would say, is the uh, detoppler um, search, which, so as I mentioned, steady signal is expected to be drifting um, because of the Doppler shift. So the uh, most, no, most used search algorithm is a tree the dispersion that kind of try to align these drifted signals to see um, to, in order to detect them. And the algorithm that we have been using is the Turbo SETI um, software, and uh, which has uh, historically been CPU based. And now we have a team of um, researchers that are trying to um, GPU accelerate it, but it's still work in progress. So, um, Currently, I don't, I don't really have a good handle on how much this is going to take, how much time this is going to take. Okay, but it is the big bottleneck right now. Yeah. All right. I see a question from uh, Justin. Raise hand, Justin. Yeah. Um, well, just a, a comment first. My my usual plug for Rhodes University. I saw in Sherry's slide that one of the early you know, SETI searches was done by Herod Fiskew who of course was at Rhodes University um, in his formative years. Um, um, oh, this one here. Uh, no, Fiskir, uh, 1973. Ah, oh, this one, yeah. yeah. So, so here it's the South African. Nice. Um, and then the, the question, so, so you know, the, the SETI is a, a specific form of transient signal, but presumably you will be detecting astronomical um, uh, transients as well. You probably filter them out, but uh, is there a way that those can be recorded and logged in some way for for astronomical purposes? Um, yeah, I mean, in principle, yes. But the uh, agreement we signed with Meerkat is that we will we'll we will use our data only for steady search purpose. Uh, we respect the fact that there are other commercial users. Uh, there is already, say, um, uh, FRB. Uh, FBFUs and there's Pulsar teams as well that are interested in looking for those types of transient with the same data streams. So we wouldn't want to okay. um, scoop their science. Um, but I mean, in principle, yes, like you said, the data is there. So, and we are very open to collaborations. So if some other uh, astronomers find our data useful, we would be, yeah, in principle, happy to share it. I could imagine you being a trigger event for you know, others as well. No, yeah, great, thanks. 
Oh, I think we have a question from Bruce. Bruce Mary next. Bruce, do you want to ask it yourself or do you want me to read it? Okay, I'll ask myself. Uh, just curious what GPUs you're using and how many you're planning to use. Uh, yeah, the GPUs. I uh, don't really have a slide on that, unfortunately. But um, so I mentioned that uh, we failed the 50%, we have the, we currently have the 50% build out and they are 64 nodes. Uh, so the plan is to build um, another uh, uh, cluster just like that. But we are looking to get better GPU. So we might be able to buy less than 64 in the second set of the um, cluster. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I think the current GPUs that we have are the 2080s. I will need to double check with Dave McMahon for that, unless uh, Richard knows. I see Richard on the car. No, Richard doesn't know uh, as well. Uh, no, I, not the model numbers, no. Yeah, but it's I think all it's in, the 2080s. But it's yeah. all NVIDIA and it's the latest technology. Right. Yeah, that's so right. How many, how many are you putting in each node? Uh, I think it's, yeah, I need to double check. I can't remember if it's one or two. I think it's one per node. One? Okay, thanks. Or maybe two. I'll, um, I'll, I'll take, uh, yeah, let me get back to you, Bruce, on that. Yeah. Okay, it's just out of interest because we're sort of looking for, uh, possible Meerkat extension correlator. Right. Um, you know, we're finding the limitation is sometimes actually the system memory bandwidth and just getting data into the system and out of the GPU and not the GPUs themselves. There's a question from Adam as well about the GPUs. Adam, do you want to? Yeah, I just wanted to know. Sorry, I know I'm taking a lot of your time. But, um, your GPUs, uh, how stable are they when everything's running? I mean, do you have to reset the servers, uh, anything like that? Uh, or is it just running seamlessly, smoothly? Um, you were asking about the stability of our GPU. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, we are still commissioning the system. So we have taken some data, but we haven't, we haven't like um, exposed them to their full um, usage just yet. Uh, so um, yeah, I think we'll, we'll know better uh, once our pipeline is fully running. No, well, we, I'm sorry, uh, Cherry. Huh. We we do yeah. know that Turbo SETI is you heavily using them, and we've we haven't seen any uh, stability issues at, at the compute nodes where we. We have uh, four GPU uh, processors per CPU processor. Okay. Right. Thanks. So Richard is talking about the GPUs that we have at the Berkeley Data Center, which right. are very similar in architecture to the Meerkat cluster. They're not exactly the same, but they are very similar. So yeah, I suppose that is a good data point to show that um, the city search is re relatively stable. OK, thank you. Interesting to know. Thank you. Oh, can I ask a silly question? Let's say you det detect a signal. What happens next? Who do you tell first? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> um, what happens next? What happens next? We detect a steady signal. Um, well, well, obviously we'll have to um, make sure that nothing went wrong in our analysis, uh, that we can really trust the signal. Um, and I think the only way to confirm it really is to reobserve. And I think um, Berkeley Listen has a small amount of um, time that we can ask for on Meerkat to um, follow up on signal of interest. So that's something we could do. But also, I mean, another st uh, strength of Berkeley Listen is that we have all these other facilities that we have partnership with. So we could, for example, point the Parks telescope to that target and use Parks as the follow-up instrument. Um, here I have a, a, a plot that I made previously 
showing the overlap time uh, of sources and range of declination. So this plot is made for Meerkat, for example. So you can see that Meerkat has a, a lot of overlap um, with the Parkes telescope being both being in the southern hemisphere. So the two telescope can co-observe um, sources in this declination range uh, for many hours per day. So this would be one strategy we could try to use uh, some of the purchase time on parks to follow up on Meerkat um, city candidates. Cool. Uh, Adrian for the question, I believe. Yes, um, about the algorithms that you'll use to search, um, will you be using pretty much exactly the same as what you've used on GBT and Parks, or uh, are these algorithms more advanced that you've got now to deploy on Meerkat? Um, so regarding the algorithm, um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so we'll be using, we, we, the plan is to deploy um, the Doppler search um, as well, because that has been like the, the standard uh, SETI search algorithm. In that sense, it will be, that's the same as GBT and Parks, um, but uh, it will require modification. For example, the, the, uh, this so-called Turbo SETI algorithm depends heavily on the cadence pattern to um, cluster SETI candidates. And with Meerkat, we won't have that. So that's why we, I mentioned this um, spatial, spatial filtering using the beams. So that would be a little modification to the uh, Turbo SETI algorithm. We'll also really need the GPU accelerated version that was not used in GBT and Parks because GBT and Parks, the way we operated was that we observe and then we save data to disk uh, and then we are offline process. So there was no requirement to deal with this in real time, whereas for Meerkat and the VLA, um, we will need to keep up uh, real time with the data flow. Uh, so those are the similarities and differences. Um, we also want to um, use machine learning algorithm that, that wasn't really done for Green Bank and Parks. Um, so that, that's, yeah, that would be a huge area to explore. So if I can just follow up on that, please. Um, so do you have a, a large group of researchers who commission and um, support the de uh, debugging and the, uh, of, of these algorithms. I mean, as you say, you do this on the fly, so you, you throw away all the data except for the likely candidates. Um, so you'll have to have some confidence that it works and you haven't proven it yet. Do you have a, a group of researchers and students that you'll dedicate a few years to, to do this? Um, what's your strategy? Yes, but we, we really could do with more help. So that's why I keep uh, advertising for new collaborations. Um, uh, so we do have a team of researchers and Richard is one of our software engineer um, helping with the Turbo City optimization as well as other things. Uh, and like Turbo City is being used across our virtual listening projects. So there are a lot of people interested in improving it in many ways. Um, so that is good because we can um, uh, share all those um, developments. Um, uh, yeah, but yeah, real time, real time deciding what is a real candidate and what is not is going to be very tricky and it's something we never had to do. Uh, I, I foresee to start with, we would just sort of run suboptimally. We would uh, probably not keep up with real time to start with and we'll, we'll have to be very, um, strict about throwing away candidates. Maybe we'll, we'll just keep a, a handful of ones that look good, that look really good. Uh, and then the, as time goes on, then we can refine the um, sifting algorithm. Thanks. Okay, excellent. Any more questions? All right, if not, this is your last chance. Otherwise, let us thank Jerry again. And uh, hope to see you more for soon. Thank you. Thanks. See you next time.
All right, great. Thanks very much for joining the colloquium, everyone. Bye-bye.